Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for September 22nd, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today by Jim Clausing on the line and Joe Harton here with me in the studio. Hi, Manny. And I am Manny Ortiz. Um, so let's, uh, and, and by the way, if folks don't realize, this is my first time hosting this show, <laughs> so bear with me. You're um, natural. So I guess we'll get uh, right into this and uh, get onto the first story. So the first story that we've got, we've got uh, Jim doing a story on the, the Xcode ghost. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Manny. Um, last uh, Wednesday, I think it was, um, some Chinese researchers uh, published some information on an iOS and OSX malware family uh, that they had identified that is being called in Xcode Ghost by most folks these days. And Palo Alto Networks has done a real nice write-up. They've dissected the the malware and done a couple of real nice write-ups on it. And I was looking over those uh, over the weekend and earlier today. Basically, what the what the deal is is. There were some trojanized versions of some libraries. Uh, Xcode is the um, software development environment for uh, developing iOS applications. And there was a trojanized version of some of these libraries um, that was being used primarily in China to, to build iOS applications. And if you used these particular versions of the developer libraries, developer packages, you ended up with malware in your in your app. Basically, the, the deal is because the packages are three gigabytes and it takes so long to download them from Apple's legit servers, um, some developers in parts of the world that had slower internet connections were looking for you know, copies that were uploaded elsewhere. And so these... Uh, these trojanized versions were um, primarily being hosted in China and were used by some Chinese developers uh, to build their applications. As a result, there were uh, at least 39 applications that made it onto the Apple, the official Apple uh, store that had this malware embedded in them. The Chinese hosting provider that where these uh, copies these malicious copies had been hosted has since taken them down, and the uh, the known copies you know the known malicious uh, apps have been taken off of the Apple Store. But you know this is just a, another reminder. You know, we 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 always say on here you know make sure you get things from you know the legitimate source. You know don't go to third party app stores. Well, in this case, right. it was also a, a case of make sure you get your development environment from the legitimate source and not from, you know, from some other third party source. The malware itself, uh, if, you know, if you had it installed, would, um, would upload some, some info about about your system. Anyway, the, there is a list of the 39 known infected apps. They have been taken off. Um, the Probably the most popular one was WeChat, um, but that's, that's that has been taken off, and hopefully, I, I'm not sure if it's been replaced with a clean version yet or not. Interesting. So, so this this actually made it into the Apple Store, right? So it's a developer package that actually made it into the Apple Store. So it, it went through some level of vetting, is that correct? Right. It, it made it through the, uh, it made it through the, um, the normal iOS um, checks that Apple runs. I, I'm not sure how it got through, but it, it did manage to get through the screening that Apple does on applications before it allows them into the app store. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like you said before, unfortunately, you know, you 
sometimes take for granted that that uh, you you would think that anything that you pull from an authorized you know Apple store you sort of almost take as you know from, as being valid and not uh, not malicious in any in any way you know and so unfortunately this stuff does happen you know as well as good as you you can put those that vetting process in place that looks at you know the sort of the the underlying code and um, you know this stuff will get through and I think that's probably the the lesson learned here is that you you still have to be careful even when you're dealing with stuff that goes into the Apple store yeah it, we've we've seen uh, in the past you know a handful of malicious apps that have made it into you know into the official Apple App Store. We've seen them make it into the Google Play Store, and and Apple and Google are both really good about once they discover them, getting them out of there. But you know, occasionally they will slip by. Even the best of checking isn't going to be a hundred percent foolproof. So, if people have downloaded one of these apps, should they delete them from their mobile device and reinstall? Is that the plan of attack for this? Deleting it is is probably a good move if it's been updated with a clean version, and I'm not entirely sure if all of them have been yet. Um, okay. Then then you should be able to go ahead and and reinstall the clean version afterwards. Yeah, or you might even get that as an automatic update um, if the clean version is in there. Yeah. So so uh, you know, wiping the device and restoring it back to uh, factory. It's yeah, probably sort of a probably last, just a last ca case effort. Well, I, I would almost argue that uh, <laughs> that you would just go ahead and do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, on the the Apple environment, the way that they've set up their devices, it's so easy to go right. back to that state and sort of bring back a, a known good state. So you might as well just do it. Right? Yeah, restore. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, I think the the next story that we've got up uh, is a story that uh, uh, that I I saw. Um, basically, it's it's talking about um, this this Seagate wireless uh, hard drive vulnerability. So, back on on March 18th, Tangible Security disclosed the vulnerability responsibly. So they actually re re uh, disclosed it to to Seagate, um, and basically it. It, uh, the vulnerability affects uh, three of their products. It's the, the Seagate Wireless Mobile Storage, the Seagate Wireless Plus Mobile Storage, and the Lassie Fuel Personal Drives. Um, and I'm hoping that I pronounced that correctly. So um, devices with, uh, with firmware versions uh, 2.2.005 and 2.3.014 um, dating back to October 14th are vulnerable to not only one, but actually this, this actually involves three separate vulnerabilities in this wireless uh, hard drive uh, product. So basically the, the first vulnerability actually deals with a, um, an undocumented hard-coded remote telnet access uh, with unfortunately default credentials. Mm. So it's basically a root, uh, a root login with a password of root. Mm. And then uh, anyone with the Wi-Fi access to the network um, that it's on can actually uh, telnet into the device. So for this particular one, you actually have to be on the wireless network that the, that the device is actually sitting on, okay. which is as, as opposed to the next two that actually can be hit from anywhere. So potentially if the device is sitting somewhere accessible to the internet, these other two um, can actually be um, compromised not, you know, without having to be physically located on the same network. So, okay. um, so the second one is a, is a direct request forced browsing flaw um, and there's a there's a couple there's actually uh, separate CVEs that are associated with all three of these that could allow uh, basically anonymous attackers with wireless access to the storage unit uh, to download files from anywhere on the file system, okay. which is obviously a bad thing. And then the third one is a uh, basically a bug that allows you to upload malicious files to a certain, it's actually in the 
the slash media slash SDA two file system. So it actually allows you to upload potentially malicious files to this uh, to this file system, which then will potentially compromise anyone else who who accesses that particular uh, file system or share. Um, so all three of the all three of the vulnerabilities have uh, I believe they've all been patched. And I think that the patches are available from uh, the Seagate uh, website at this point. Um, so obviously, if you've got one of these devices, the first thing you're going to want to do is go get your firmware updated um, to, uh, to make sure that you're not uh, vulnerable to these three, three attacks. That slash media slash SBA2 is, is a portion that is specifically set aside for sharing you know, on, your, you know, on your local network there so right the fact that yeah. they could upload malicious files there is is a really bad thing you yep. know this is another one of those internet of insecure things type of devices that we talk about on this show it seems like every week or every other week that really should not be accessible from from anywhere except right. you know your your local network you need to make sure that you can't see it, um, and yeah, that it that it is, isn't internet accessible, and that ideally, I'd I'd prefer that it was you know, off in some DMZ someplace, or our producer is right. saying here they you know, just use a cable, don't use it wireless, yeah. plug it in. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I you know, and uh, but unfortunately, you know, again, this is trying to take advantage of, uh, you know, of being able to set up a drive. I mean, you know, obviously the, a Seagate drive that's wireless has it, its advantages to be able to do it that way. But unfortunately, sometimes these features, you know, these features that they call them, um, end up causing, you know, it creates more opportunity for these types of vulnerabilities to end up existing in these, in, uh, in these types of devices. So. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, unfortunately, in this case, you know, it wasn't just one, it was three separate vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, two of them were, you know, you didn't have to be physically located with the right. device, which makes it even worse, you know, so, so de definitely uh, go out and find, uh, find and download and, and update that firmware if you've got one of these devices. So next, uh, the next story we have, uh, I believe, Joe, you've got this story, right? Yep. Uh, it's the uh, Adobe Flash. Yeah, so Brian Krebs uh, at Krebs on Security had a blog post about basically precipitated by Adobe releasing 20 patches for Flash uh, this week. So Flash is up to version 19.00.185. And Krebs, you know, he, he's, he's uh, in the past, he's recommended that users either abandon Flash completely based on the volume of these patches that they're constantly releasing and known issues with Flash, or you know, if, if users are reluctant to abandon Flash completely to, to use a dual browser approach. So have a, have a browser for Flash-based websites and have your main browser just with Flash completely disabled. But Krebs uh, points out a really surprising parallel point on this stuff that the Adobe Shockwave player, which, you know, it's like the Flash version of Windows Media Player, so it's you've probably seen it in browsing websites, Shockwave. That Shockwave just put out, uh, or Adobe just put out a release of Shockwave September 8th, so recently, that actually bundles the version of Flash version 16. So it's a three three versions old release of Flash embedded within Shockwave. And Krebs found there's 155 vulnerabilities in that version of Flash that Adobe's releasing, releasing with Shockwave. So, uh, you know, I picked up on that and just thought, you know, Brian Krebs always seems to find these really, I don't know if scary is the right term, but really eye-opening things out in the wild. And he's sort of adamant about uh, users abandoning Shockwave for sure altogether. So um, just a sort of interesting thing that he put out there this week. Quite, quite frankly, I, I, I'm utterly shocked at this one because I have to imagine that this is probably the first time on this show that we've done a vulnerability for Flash. Is that correct? Uh, probably not. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 
<clears throat> yeah, uh, that's that is very unfortunate, especially you know the the the, the bundled version being know, that just, far you out of date. And you're like, wow. Yeah. 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 You know, unfortunately, that you know the flash we all know it's been around for a while and it's it's had its issues and they continue to try to patch it but you yeah know, I know Krebs is obviously pushing for them to abandon it and I think they've got some technologies now today that you know can easily yeah, take HTML the place yeah, exactly, and, yeah. absolutely yeah yeah but that's just going to move the the issues I mean the, the fact yeah, is maybe. the users like their nice flashy websites so you're going to have this active content and you know, once everybody stops using Flash, then they'll find ways to do it with HTML5. So that, yeah. it isn't the problem isn't going to go away. It's just going to move. Well, you hope that users also like a secure product. So, okay, all right, um, and then we'll move on to the next one here. I think uh, I think Joe, you're you've got this one too. So this yeah. is uh, the Bugzilla exploit. Yeah. So last week I talked about an issue with Mozilla's internal Bugzilla project um, for their Firefox browser. This is an, an issue actually with the Bugzilla bug tracking software that other companies can use. So if, you know, say your development team used Bugzilla to track your own bugs, this is more of that side of Bugzilla. Um, basically what they found is a user can register for an account on, with Bugzilla and then go through and change some permissions and grant themselves admin privileges. So uh, what that turns into is, you know, any potential attacker with access to non-public bugs within any Bugzilla repository. So it was actually the security firm Perimeter X that found this, and they, um, you know, they published it. They they wrote about which versions are susceptible. So, you know, it's it's pretty dangerous because you know this could expose vulnerabilities, zero days. You know, depending on what your Bugzilla repository houses, you're really risking exposing that to the general public. So uh, the recommendation is up to upgrade to the latest patch version. They have patched it. Um, I think that's usually our recommendation. But you know, this one, it's another one that you know, as a developer, it's something that you know, not just you know any user might see, but somebody who has a development project which uses this bug tracker, um, you could really be asking for trouble. Yeah, I, I, I wonder on this one if, um, you know, because obviously the, the potential here, the downside here is that is that non-publicized non bugs may have now been released as part of this, right? right. So, so what's the responsible thing to do in terms of, hey, we know that these bugs that you know, we were supposed to hold and keep secret right. are now sort of known out there. So do we now let the, you know, yeah. either those vendors know that, you know, that they've been released, you know, so that they can prepare themselves and the rest of us can prepare ourselves? Because right now we, we won't we won't know anything about what's, you know, what's sort of been taken here. Yeah, you wonder what the, the response from sort of um, honest users of this will be, but hopefully they'll do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting one. I I I wonder what's going to happen with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and then I think uh, I think keep Joe, it, keep it rolling. Keep, keep, keep it, rolling. it rolling. I think I you've got. I think you've got one more. So. Yeah. So this is a little bit more of our standard uh, vulnerability exploit case, but the sinful knock, Cisco router implant. It's uh, it's sort of the latest version of this router compromise we see. A lot of times we see them on on more home routers, but this is actually a uh, uh, an issue Mandiant found on Cisco service routers. So Cisco's in integrated service routers, the Cisco model 1841, 2811, and 3825, all of which are no longer sold, but I think all of which are pretty extensively out in network infrastructure. So. Mandy had found 14 service routers in four countries, specifically Mexico, Ukraine, India, and the Philippines. And uh, basically, this uh, this is an exploit that provides a backdoor. So it's it's a modified firmware Cisco IOS image that allows a backdoor for re-entry. So it's kind of scary. They put out a write-up on how they believe it happened. That's Mandy. 
basically they see that the malware was executed in the OS image through modification of their scheduling utility within the iOS. And, uh, and there's also a, a capability to do command and control, um, which is initiated by the TCP, by TCP SYN trigger packets. So the SYNful, S-Y-N-ful is the name. You know, it's, it's a really detailed and, and complicated um, exploit um, that, you know, it's worth investigation for folks who are in this sort of service router part of the network. Um, you know, the, the only real, way to address it right now is to re-image the router, which for a service router can be fairly significant, so. Um. Yeah, and unfortunately this is, you know, you're talking about firm, firmware here, so yeah. I think one of the things that, that I read when I was going through this story was that you're, because it's firmware, it survives a reboot. Right. And that's, and that's, the, that's really the bad thing here is that, you know, um, you could, you know, you think, just rebooting this thing, you're going to kick this thing out, but that's not the case. Right. So this is this has basically been embedded into the into the firmware, and they've actually modified it enough so that because a lot of times with firmware, um, the admins will look at sizes of files, the the actual firmware files. And I think what what I read was that they when they modified the firmware to insert the malicious code within it, uh -huh. they eliminated other pieces of the firmware that weren't required that wouldn't be missing so that it wouldn't affect the size of the file. So it wouldn't raise a flag when, you know, when somebody so looked a, at the firmware and said, oh, this doesn't, yeah. Come back the same way. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if it would actually pass any kind of checksum, okay. but they, they tried to make it so that at least visually it wouldn't, uh, uh, it wouldn't raise any alarms, which, you know, makes it that much more dangerous. Yeah, and there, there's there been an update since since uh, the initial, since Mandiant initially uh, reported, and there are now at least 200 known infected uh, devices. But the, the part of it that really got my attention was the use of the port knocking. I, that's something that I, that I've seen used you know, by legitimate folks to to try to hide the fact that they're running services, you know, by using port knocking. And the idea with port knocking is you don't even start the up the daemon, you know, SSH, for example. You don't even start it up until you get a, a certain certain sequence of packets. That's why they call it port knocking. You, you send a certain sequence of packets the server recognizes that that's the trigger to turn things on, and then and then it turns on the daemon, and that's that's what the the malware here is doing is it's using these crafted sin packets to then turn on certain services and allow upload of uh, enabling of modules, so they can, for example, turn on Telnet. Uh, when SSH was all that was initially, um, you know, configured, yeah. or turn on HTTP uh, when HTTPS was all that was originally configured in there, and the, all that the admins can see in the configs are, you know, the services that they've explicitly enabled. So it it is. I, I I'd like to take a closer look at the at the malware itself, because this is the first time I've seen the bad guys using port knocking, although they probably have, and I just haven't seen it before. But uh, yeah, that was yeah, that so was that, a twist that got my attention. Yeah, so that's that, that's an interesting point. So that, that port knocking, so um, does that basically make it so that the, the malicious code is sort of hidden until that actual port knocking actually happens. So before that happens, the router probably seems like it's fine. It's right. not doing anything else, right? Exactly. Yeah. It, prior to the that port knocking taking place, if you were to do, you know, a port scan, you would not see these backdoor ports open. And then the the bad guys send the the crafted packet to, to do the port knocking. And then the router opens these up, and they can get in. Okay. Yeah. 
that's this this is probably a, a, a one that you know yeah, it's would, something it's significant and, and yeah. far reaching you know it's, yeah. it's it's a high level in the network that you know it's it's got large consequences yeah and like you said before even though these particular Cisco routers aren't aren't sold anymore they're pretty prevalent out on the yeah they're not the type of thing you would replace without significant time and effort right so, yeah. yeah and you know they're they're still out there in use they're still available on eBay you know uh, for folks who don't have big budgets that's one of the favorite right. places they go to look for used Cisco gear and there are a lot of them out there okay all right well as uh, as quickly as uh, as we got started uh, I think we've uh, we've actually come to the uh, to the end of the show, so uh, so that's the uh, that's the show for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can me email us at uh, attthreattrack at list .att .com. Um, You can find the att threat track on the AT and T Tech Channel on YouTube and iTunes. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, the handle is at ATT Security. Uh, also, um, please also don't forget to register to watch the AT&T Cybersecurity Conference or to attend to, uh, live to meet the AT&T Threat Track contributors at uh, att.com slash security conference. Yeah, I'm um, going to be in New York City for that. Yep, and that's, that's yep. So uh, it, that's going to be in New York City. Nice. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, going to start uh, working out my wrist for all the autographs that I'm going to be doing while I'm there. Giveaways. I think we're That's, giving stuff uh, away. And, and give some giveaways, actually. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So uh, so thank you, uh, Jim, and, and thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm Manny Ortiz, and uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, don't let the hackers win. <laughs>